This is Holy Week. We are on the way to Easter. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Easter Island. Anybody ever heard of Easter Island? Okay, all right. Some, most of us are a little bit older if you've heard of it. If you're not familiar with it, don't feel bad. It's this little obscure island way out in the Pacific off the coast of Chile. And it's right here. And I'm told there are less than 1,000 people living on this island. You probably wouldn't even know about the island if it weren't for these strange-looking bobblehead statues. Does that ring a bell? Anybody recognize seeing those in the old magazines, National Geographic and stuff? This is a relic of a bygone era. There were people, obviously a civilization of some sort, that came along and thought this was important. And they carved these things, and you know it was hard work, and you know it took a long time to do these, because they're huge. They're bigger than a person. You can't really get a size of scale, but they are massive. They weigh tons. Not really sure why they're there, but only a handful of tourists come see it every year. In fact, if it weren't for these bobble-headed little guys, we probably wouldn't even know about it. And it makes me wonder if this place has such little importance on politics and religion and economics in the whole world that if it weren't for these one little group of relics, would we even be talking about Easter Island? And I got to thinking about that, and I wonder if Palm Sunday and our modern day observance of Easter is likewise kind of relegated to a relic of the past. Not to you, but to the world at large. I wonder, has it been kind of just put on the back burner and now we think of it as just a bunch of colored Easter eggs and bunnies and fancy hats and dresses and Maybe if you're super spiritual, an annual pilgrimage to the church, a local church of your choice. And I was thinking, does the lost world, do people who are looking for hope, people driving by these roads right now, do they view us like we viewed those statues? You know, I got to thinking, there are people who legitimately ask good questions today. And they say, well, you know, I hear about Easter. I know about the cross. I know about Palm Sunday. I'm not really sure what it's all about, but... What does that have to do with me today? And it's a good question. There's nothing wrong with asking big, hard questions. God can handle it. In fact, if I'm honest, that is the exact question I asked a youth pastor some years ago. And it was eye-opening to hear his response. See, the truth is, unless you know Jesus, Palm Sunday is irrelevant. Unless you know the power of the saving, redeeming power of the Lord Jesus and how he can forgive our sins and give us a fresh start. Make Unless you know that, Palm Sunday, even Easter, is just kind of like a, a relic of a bygone era. But it is so much more than that. And I'm so excited that you are here. And if you're joining us online, welcome. It is great to have you because today we're going to see the life-changing truths to remind us that this is the start of Holy Week. And the empty tomb that we know about changes everything. This is the reminder that death didn't win. Today is bittersweet because we're celebrating, but at the same time, we also look ahead and we know what awaited Jesus just a few days later. So if you're ready to dive in, let me set the context of what we're about to read. The events of Palm Sunday are often referred to as Jesus' triumphal entry. If you're new to the faith or you're just checking out the Christianity thing, you're wondering, the triumphal entry is huge. In fact, you can tell a story is big and important and powerful by how many times it's mentioned in scripture. Sometimes Mark will record something, or the Gospel of Luke, or Matthew, or John. This is one of the few stories that's mentioned in all four Gospels, okay? So take note, that should be a huge warning sign. This is huge, it is a big deal, this is very important. This was a, a day that began with this massive parade. Like a huge parade. We're going to see just how big in a minute. This was an event like no other. But for those who know how this week ends, it's kind of tinged with just a hint of sadness. Because we know as much as people are cheering right now and they are having a field day and they're crying out Hosanna, we know that this marks the beginning of Jesus' journey toward the cross. By the way, that's a journey he didn't have to make. He was innocent. He was going out of obedience to the Father. In fact, there's this little tiny prayer where Jesus is seen in the garden. He says, Father, if there's any way you can take this cup from me that I don't have to drink it. Nevertheless, not what I want, 
but what you want. Because he knew. He knew what was coming. Jesus was about to go so far above and beyond what anyone expected to show love, to be a bridge for us, okay? To give us a fresh start of purpose, okay? So that's the context of what we're looking at. Look at Matthew 21, starting in verse 1. So now they're approaching. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, okay, so this is a, a kind of a village on the outside of Jerusalem. Almost see it. It's a little far away, and they're outside still. Jesus sends two disciples on ahead, telling them, go into the village ahead of you. At once, you will find a donkey tied there with her foal, okay, her baby. Untie them both and bring them to me. And if anyone says, hey, what are you doing? Say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. Hey, okay, look at Jesus already taking care of this. This is amazing. Verse 4, this took place so that what was spoken through the prophet, we're going to see that with Zechariah here in a minute, might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, okay, tell Jerusalem, see, your king is coming to you. He's gentle. He's mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and its foal. Then they laid their clothes on them, and Jesus sat on them. Oh, there's so much gold hiding right here. Now, when we think of donkeys today, most of us think of something like this, right? This is what we think of, whether it's Eeyore or Shrek or, uh, I don't know, what this one, the Columbia donkey and Gus and Nestor, the flying, talking donkey, whatever. This is kind of the limit of our knowledge, right? I mean, most of us don't have donkeys. We don't raise them. I know some raise chickens and stuff, but... Not many people raise donkeys, and we don't really have a whole lot of insight, except for we're familiar with their personality. Donkeys are known for being stubborn, right? And they're also known for this goofy grin that occasionally they have. And you look and you think, okay, well, that's kind of cute, but it's certainly not something I would call majestic or heroic or something worthy of a king to ride in. When we think of Jesus making a triumphant entry into the Jewish holy city, their capital, did you ever wonder, <laughs> why that? Why would Jesus choose that? I mean, I hope he wasn't making that face when he came in, but this, this is covered with hidden gold. There is so much stuff happening here. At first glance, it seems like maybe Jesus was picking this because it was a practical matter. Maybe he was tired. He'd been walking a lot. Or maybe there was no horses. He couldn't find any camels. They were all rented out at the Enterprise Rent-A-Beast. And so he had to say, mm, plan B, let's find a donkey. I foresee in a town ahead there's a donkey and her baby. And there's going to be a guy mad that you're stealing it, so tell him, no, 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 the Lord. I mean, think about this. It's so bizarre. What, why would he do this? There is a reason here, and this is so incredible. Even this detail this lowly beast was part of God's master plan. See, way back in the Old Testament, Zechariah prophesied something unbelievably specific. Don't you love these vague prophecies, these modern-day prophets? You will have good fortune in your future sometime. And you're like, what? That's, what does that mean? This was specific. This was incredible. Zechariah was a great man. In fact, he was one of only three prophets to also be a priest at the same time. He was a good and a godly man. And in Zechariah 9.9, 9, he has a prophecy that the Messiah would come riding on a young donkey. Okay? With what we just read in Matthew, see if this verse sounds familiar. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous, victorious, lowly. Okay, there's the humility. Riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Do you see this? This was predicted over 540 years before Jesus did it. Think about that. 500, okay, to put that in context, that would be like a prophecy in 1492. Christopher Columbus was talking about, there will be a gathering in Apex, North Carolina. Susan Jackson will be seated wearing a blue vest with her arms folded next to Linda Young. You know, do you see how bizarre, how oddly specific that is? That's, th so this is amazing. So Jesus is fulfilling this. This is not an accident. Jesus specifically wanted a donkey. And what I thought was kind of plan B ended up being God's plan A. This fulfilled a specific prophecy hundreds of years prior to Jesus even being here. Now, when you look at a donkey, you might think, okay, he's kind of cute. Maybe even cuddly, right? Oh, I want one, right? And we just put him, you know, in our bed. and put, well, Maybe not that. And we, we have this, this idea that he's cute and cuddly, but there's no way do we think this is a majestic beast. But we forget this. Back then in the Roman days, they were in control of Jerusalem, and they were not nice to the Jews. 
They were oppressing them. And the soldiers would come into town riding these majestic war horses. And they were doing it to project strength. They were doing it out of intimidation. It was the sign of a king. A victorious general would ride into battle and he would be on these huge white steeds and they would wear... We would do this all the way up through the Napoleon era, not long ago. This was a mark of power. If you were a king and you were about to announce your kingship, this is what you would ride. You would not choose that. There's me and Elliot and Jason coming in. Think about that. Let me ask you. If you were riding into town to announce your kingship of Apex... Would you choose A or B? It's so bizarre. Why would Jesus do that? Y'all, there's hidden gold right here. Most people miss the fantastic irony. This donkey, which is purely representing humility, the ironic part, the twist here is that by riding this donkey, Jesus was actually proclaiming he was the Messiah. He was the king. That's what this meant. But it went over almost everybody's head, except for devout Jews. Devout Jews would have known Zechariah 9.9. They would have looked at that and said, what is he doing? This is not right. See, people are like, I can't believe he's writing that. They're like, no, 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 no. We can't believe he's writing this. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. Who does he think he is? Jesus was reaching back to the past and also indicating the future. Your king is coming. I am fulfilling a prophecy in your midst. I'm pointing to the future, but I'm not coming as some earthly king like you imagine. I am coming to announce the reign of God's kingdom to come and that I am bringing peace and I will allow you to unite with the Father. Your sins can be forgiven. See, the Jews have been waiting throughout the centuries for this and here he is. He's in their midst and most of them are clueless. They are missing this. So don't miss the lesson for all of us. Jesus is showing incredible humility. He's riding a beast of burden. He's riding a beast that is laughed at, that is mocked, that no king would ever ride. And he shows such humility to ride himself into the story, knowing what would take place just five days later. He did it for us. Humility. Now, when you think of humility, who do you think of? Maybe Billy Graham? Maybe somebody who's a servant-hearted person who does things behind the scenes no one knows about. I think of a modern-day hero, Corey Ten Boom. This gracious, humble, quiet, lovely, God-fearing woman who literally hid hundreds of Jews in her walls. You see the trap door she's, taught, she's showing you, the hiding place, saving them from the German Holocaust. Hundreds of Jews survived because of this woman's boldness, knowing she faced certain death. People heralded her as a hero. Wow, I can't believe you did that. You're so amazing. And they wanted to put her up on a pedestal and make monuments to her. And she's like, no, no, no. And someone came up to her and said, do you ever have a problem remaining humble with all of these accolades, with all the great things you've done for the Lord Jesus? You know what her reply was? It is perfect for Palm Sunday. She said, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on the back of that humble donkey, and everyone's waving their palm branches, and they're throwing their coats down on the floor in front of it, saying, Hosanna, and they're waving, and they're making this huge hoopla, and they're, and they're sharing all these great praises. Do you ever think for one second it entered the mind of that donkey that all this was for him? Of course not. And then she said this, and I quote, if I can be the lowly donkey on which Jesus is exalted and he gets the glory, then I happily give him all the praise and all the honor. Wow, what humility. So you know I gotta ask, how's our humility? When people see us, do they see a proud person? Do they see someone who's kind of arrogant, kind of full of themselves? Or do they see somebody also who's maybe insecure? Because of that, we compensate. And we project some arrogance and some strength and pride, but it's still pride. Or do they see humility? If you've been struggling during the season, if COVID and job loss and inflation and you name it, if it has kicked you in the gut, and this has been a season of struggle, and you're not sure what your tomorrow looks like, I have a truth grenade for you. When you look at all of this that we've read so far, here is your true critique. If Jesus knew that a donkey was waiting for him 
all the way over to the next town. He absolutely, positively, certainly knows what lies down the road for you. He does. That should make every one of us smile. If Jesus could predict all of this down the road, a guy's going to ask, hey, what are you doing? Don't let that. And bring it, not just one, but bring two. Bring them here. It's going to be over. If he could see that all the way in the next town, he knows what's in store for you. He knows. You may be looking ahead and thinking, what is this medical test going to turn out? Man, I don't want to get that call from the doctor. Wasn't long ago, we would wake up every morning, and I would, I'm, I'm just being honest, I would dread flipping my phone over to see if that call came during the night, knowing my mom was gone. Hated it. Hated it. Every night. The doctor's saying, today's the day. Make your final preparations. We'd go to bed, wake up, oh, this is it. Wow. And we'd do it all over again and again. You may be waiting in a, in a period like that. You may not know where your job's going to be next week. You may not be able to look down the road and go, I don't even know if I'm going to have a job. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to make the payment on my mortgage next month. I'm tapped out. I got nothing. I want you to look at what's on the screen. He knows. He is looking down the road. Jesus has already in mind the plans he has to provide for you, to sustain you. Okay? Here's why this matters in 2022. Understanding that Jesus knows everything builds our confidence so that we can follow him. Did you catch that? Understanding, and not just hearing it here, but bringing it in here. When we know and truly internalize, God, you really do know everything. I trust that you have. When you, it gives you the confidence to follow, to take that next step, to go forward and say, that's it. I am all in. Just like these people declared when they were baptized. I'm all in. I trust him. If he knows that a donkey is waiting for him in the next town, he certainly knows what's around the corner for me. All right, now, check out what happens next in the story. Keep reading. Look at verse 8. A very large crowd comes. They spread their clothes out on the road. Others were cutting down branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of Jesus and those who followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar. Remember that. We're coming back to that. Was in an uproar saying, who is this? Like Elvis is in the building. Who is this guy? And the crowds were saying, oh, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. They got it sort of right. This is the prophet. He's from Nazareth in Galilee, right? Now, there's a couple hidden gems right here that if you're like me and you kind of grew up in and out of church, you've heard this story, you read it a hundred times, you're kind of like, oh, it's Palm Sunday. We, we wave the branches. It's good. And that's it. There's so much more going on. When I sing Hosanna, and when we hear that Hosanna, every one of us probably thinks it is some cry of jubilation, you know, like, woo, Hosanna, dilly dilly, or roll tide, something that we just shout out, right? Some kind of toast. It's not. But because of the context, we kind of get this false impression that it's like, woo, Hosanna, wait, do you know what it really means? It means save us. It means help us, Lord, deliver us. Hosanna, will you come? Messiah, save us. We're sinking. We are in trouble. Now look at verse 10. There's more hidden gold, okay? This, Matthew says the whole city was in an uproar. Are you ready for this? This is so amazing to me. He uses a rare term that's not used that often in Scripture. He uses a Greek word called seio. Seio is a word that literally means to shake or to violently have like a seismic event. That's where we get our English word seismic, as in earthquake. Are you getting it now? He is you. He said, so Matthew's saying, when the arrival of Jesus showed up, it was a seismic event that day. It felt like an earthquake had entered the town on Palm Sunday. How cool is that? When the kids went to Winter Jam a couple weeks ago, they said KB came out. And there's 30,000 people cracked in the RBC Center. And one of the guys says, when I pick up this coat, I want you all to lose your mind for Jesus. And he dropped his coat, and it was quiet down and he picked that thing up and the crowd went berserk they were going crazy man i bet it felt like an earthquake i bet it was a seismic event right you guys were there right it was incredible that's what matthew's saying it wasn't like hosanna woo this was a huge deal they were coming and jesus is seeing all these palm fronds this is a sign of victory and now the the, the locals and the authorities are going wait a minute whoa, whoa, whoa what's going on he's not a king why are they treating him like a king 
And the people started thinking, yeah, he is our king. You know what? He's going to overthrow you wascally womans. He's going to come in. He's going to change everything. He's our guy, and we're going to follow him. And Peter's already picking out new curtains in the palace, and he's like, who's with me? And he goes, and nobody's following him because Jesus didn't show up bringing the same kingship everybody was expecting. He showed up and did something so strange. In fact, almost as quickly as the crowds cheered him, it was really weird. They began to fall away. They began to just kind of melt back. The crowd would soon discover that this king wasn't what they wanted. It wasn't the one they expected. All right, let me put this in modern day terms, okay? Something maybe everyone can relate to. Easter's coming up. Let's say your kids have been great all year. They've been working hard. They got good grades. They've been inviting their kids to church, their friends. You know, they've been going to bed early and not staying up, playing games all night long. You know what I'm saying? Just throwing that out there. And they've been good. They've been good kids. And you think, you know what? We're going to reward them. We're going to give them a reward. They've earned it. They deserve this. So you load them up in the family truckster. And you drive. You say, guys, the reward you've been waiting for is coming. And you drive it, and they're like, woo, and they're cheering you on. They're waving their shirts and stuff. They're like, woo, yeah, mom and dad are the greatest parents ever. You know, this reward, because we know what the reward's going to be. And sure enough, you turn into Walmart. <laughs> and you put it in park. <laughs> and you turn around, and you look, and you say, son, daughters, you've been working hard, serving the king. <laughs> you've been working hard. I'm going to let you go in. And it's your choice. You can pick either a four-pack of Cadbury cream eggs <laughs> or one of those boxes of those nasty rubber marshmallow peat things. Who eats those? Do you, no, you don't. I think less of you. Those things are horrible. And you're looking at them, and you're like, oh. And the, to your shock, the kids go, yes. Oh, yes. That's exactly what. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. no, no, no. I, I was kidding. Surprise. You put it in drive. You said, guess where we're going? We're taking you to the airport. We're getting on a plane. It's so much bigger than what you thought. You were excited about peeps. I'm taking you on a week trip to Disney, followed by 10 days at Universal. We have Fast Pass. We get to sleep in the castle. Tabitha's hooked us up with all kinds of secrets. It's incredible. And you're like, woo. And now imagine your shock if you look back in the seat. And they're going, oh, no. That, we, we wanted peeps. <laughs> <coughs> Can you imagine your shock? They're like, oh, no, 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 we, we don't want all that. Who wants that? We, can we still get the peeps? Can we get my, my Cadbury cream eggs? And you're like stunned. What was happening? They were thinking way too small. They were so excited about something that they were looking in the here and now. I can have peeps now, or I got to wait like an hour to fly down there. Oh, no, no, no. See, yeah, this is what I think of. These crowds, they were cheering him. They begin to fall away, and they're like, wait a minute. Something's not right. We were cheering. They could almost taste the victory. He was going to set up this great political, we thought, this great earthly kingdom. He's going above and beyond. He's saying, no, 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 no. No, no, you missed it. I'm, I am a heavenly king first. I've left my throne in glory to come and buy you back from sin in the grave. I'm not talking about just an earthly thing. That'll come, by the way. I'm talking about the heavenly thing. My victory is the ultimate victory over sin and death. It's not just giving you peeps. I'm here to bring you into a right relationship with the Father. I am going to be the bridge. And the disciples were like, but can we still get the Cadbury cream eggs? Because that's kind of what we were expecting. They didn't get it. In fact, John put it this way. He says, his disciples didn't understand these things at first. I mean, it's openly. He admits it. However, when Jesus was glorified, okay, so this is after he's died, he's been buried, he's resurrected, he's ascended to the Father. After all that, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and that he had done all these things that kind of had that light bulb moment, like, oh my goodness, of course, of course, Disneyland is so much better than Peeps. I totally get it. So I got to ask you, what about you? What are your expectations? when Jesus saved us from our sin? What are your expectations for Christianity? What is your expectation for your faith? What do you expect from Jesus this Easter season? What is your purpose for living this Palm Sunday? So I think we put God in a box. You know, I think we, we settle for the small thing. We're content to play little mud cakes in the, the puddle beside the beach when God says, 
I give you this ocean, and you're content to sit here and play in the puddles. What I have for you is so much bigger, and the devil has blinded us to be focused on such trivial things, chasing a paycheck, getting a better car, more followers on Instagram, all these goofy things that don't mean anything in the grand scheme of why God came. The disciples were thinking way too small. What about us? I heard a, a great story years ago, and you've heard it probably a dozen times. It said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your big plans. Right? <laughs> He's like, child, come on. I got so much more. See, Palm Sunday is the perfect day to reevaluate your life. Palm Sunday is the perfect day. It, it's a snapshot in time. It, it encapsulates everything about Jesus. It shows his sacrifice, shows his love, his commitment to going to the cross, that greater purpose, so much greater than the disciples knew, so much greater than anyone could fathom. He, he rode into Jerusalem on a humble donkey, and he couldn't care less what the people thought of him because he was a man on a mission, riding that donkey, knowing it's not about the palm fronds, not about the coats, not about the cheers. It's about what was at the end of that road, that cross. And he willingly did it. They're like, no, you're a political leader. You're going to come in. You're going to build back better. You're going to make Jerusalem great again. And he's like, no, it ain't about that. I'm not going to be your earthly king. I'm here to set things right. I'm here to pay a debt that I don't even owe. That's what Jesus did. And this blows my mind. And I'm looking at this crowd and reading these scriptures. The very same crowd that was cheering Hosanna would just in a few days say, kill him. <laughs> Wait, what? Hosanna, Hosanna, kill him. It's like Jekyll and Hyde. They're saying crucify him. We see it in the scripture. They're literally saying that. But yet it didn't change Jesus' purpose. He didn't get all his feelings hurt. Go, Man, these people are so fickle. They're so mean. I'm going home. He didn't do any of that. Nothing deterred him. He was not dependent on human approval. He wasn't dependent on their praise. How about you? Let me talk to the younglings. If you're in college, you're in high school, junior high, man, I get it. It's tough to stand up for Christ. But it's worth it. It's worth it. At the end of this, you have your eyes on the prize. You get to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You professed me in front of these. I will profess you now in front of the Father. Never keep your gaze on these things that are just shiny trinkets that distract us. Remember the prize. Because of Palm Sunday, because what it means in Holy Week, because we see God laying out the road to be that bridge, it changes everything and it gives us boldness. Because Jesus can look down the road and see a donkey in another city, we can say, you know what? He can look down the road and see how that test is going to turn out. We can look down the road and see that even though I don't have a 401k, I'm going to be all right. God's going to find a way to take care of me. He promised that. We can see down the road and go, you know what? My kids aren't even talking to me. It's okay. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. On a day when we gather and 75% of the world drives right on by without a second thought, the day will come when you have to stand up. The day will come when you will have to have that single-minded purpose like Jesus and say, I am willing to take up my cross. I'm willing to stand for him. Even though they make fun of me, even though they mock me, even though that family member doesn't talk to me, even though my boss threatens my job. We know, we know how it ends. Before it gets better, it gets worse. That's okay. We know that. We link arms with each other. That's why the church is so critical. That's why we come. We link arms. We have each other's back. We heal each other through our wounds, through these seasons that get dark. So if you're new and you've been checking this out, or maybe you just stumbled on this stream today and you don't know how, it wasn't an accident. If you've never heard the good news summarized, I want to land the plane with one powerful, simple verse, and it says this. God so loved the world that he allowed his one and only son to die for you. And if you believe in that, you will not perish. There is no lake of fire waiting for you, but you will have 
eternal life. See, that's Jesus' purpose. It was come to bring love, to be that bridge, that, that gap, to provide a way from us who have sin. I hope all of us agree with that. To where we can be reconciled with a holy God who is filled with unapproachable light and majesty and has such incredible things in store for you and your loved ones, by the way, who know the Lord, who are already there, are dancing and cannot wait to see you. I can't even describe how amazing it is. In fact, I'm probably going to preach on that coming up where let's just remind ourselves what it truly waits for us. It is incredible. He did all that so that we could accept his love. God sent that. Everything was impossible for this. We were separated from God. Sin and death was that barrier. But now what was impossible is possible. We can come alive. Have you done that? Have you had that relationship? Like we've seen some of these people who were baptized this morning. Have you had a moment in time where you say, God, you know what? I've made a mess. I agree with you. I've, I've blown it. I swallow my pride and I admit, you are Lord. You are who you say you are. And I need you. Will you forgive me? Will you sweep my heart, my life clean as I repent of my sin? I forsake it. I'm done with it. Will you break those chains? Have you done that? You can. You can today. In fact, let's do it. Would you bow with me? Let's pray together right now. Tune out the distractions. Tell the Lord in your own words, Father, your word says that if we believe and confess that you are Lord, Believe that you were raised from the dead, that you will save us. We, we cling to that promise. We need that. There is nothing I can do in my own power to earn your favor. I can't be good enough. I know my sin. I know my flesh. It fails all the time. So today I kneel. I acknowledge my heart is bent before you, and I accept what you did on the cross. Holy Spirit, would you invade my world? take ownership. I surrender the rights of leadership to you. Make me clean. Make me a new creation, Lord. I, I, I want that purpose. I want that passion that Pastor Matt's talking about. Give me a reason to get out of bed in the morning besides just the daily grind of just going and getting another check and coming home and going to bed and getting up and doing it all over again. Thank you that you've shown us in your word there is more. So much more. The vast ocean is ahead of us, God. Help us to not be content to just play in the kiddie pool. You have so much more for us. We embrace it. We claim that. In Jesus' name, amen.